Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone out there. Uh, very happy that you are with us today for this, uh, what I think will be a very interesting event. Uh, th this event, which uh, Francisco Pedraza will be uh, uh, kicking off momentarily, is uh, sponsored by and is part of our activities at the Center for Latinos and American Politics Research here at Arizona State University. We have a number of activities and events as part of our initiatives. And this is uh, this distinguished speaker series is an important part of that. And we'll be telling you uh, more uh, momentarily. I just want to give very quick background about this. Uh, there's a lot of you know, great research in Latino politics. A lot of it has a strong behavioral kind of emphasis. One of the things that we at, at our center have tried to encourage and support and facilitate is research that has an institutions kind of focus, institutions focus, because it is our sense that that is an area of, of Latino politics that has been understudied. So in a variety of ways, we are trying to encourage that. And one of those is uh, through the presentation today. So Andrea Silva will be making her presentation on direct democracy and its various institutions and how those ha affect politics. Uh, again, I, I think it's correct to say an understudied area. So let me go ahead and turn it over to Francisco Pedraza and he will be introducing Andrea. But again, thank all of you for being here and we hope you'll enjoy it and we will have questions and answer period uh, at the end. So again, thank you for coming and uh, Francisco, please uh, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, delighted to be hosting you uh, virtually today uh, for the first of our 2022 Distinguished Speaker Series. Um, we are really pleased to um, hear today from uh, Professor Andrea Silva, who's coming to us virtually from the University of North Texas, where she has an appointment in the political science department. And she's going to teach us a little bit about what's going on at the subnational level when it comes to immigration legislation. Lots of complex stuff happening, and she has taken a bite out of this really complex uh, topic to give us some insight on not just sort of the nitty gritty uh, patterns of uh, what kinds of public policies are being passed that impact or about immigration uh, politics, but also what affects the passage of those state immigration laws, as well as giving us some ideas of the causal mechanisms that link state legislative institutions and state immigration policy. She's gonna be able to tell us more about that in her own words. So without ado, Professor Silva, I invite you to share your screen and tell us a little bit more about this exciting book you have. <laughs> thanks, Francisco. Thanks, Francisco. And thank you, Rodney. And thanks, everybody at Clapper for having me. I'm really excited, Clapper, to you. Um, I, uh, I, I'm really excited. Uh, I, I'm in the final stages of this book project. And uh, I've submitted my uh, my final draft to NYU Press. Uh, but I'd be really interested in hearing kind of uh, your thoughts and ideas about um, you know, ways that I can improve. It's not, it's not at the copyright, uh, copy editing stage just yet. So, you know, I, I'm still able to include some, uh, some of the no doubt amazing ideas that will be introduced here uh, at this, um, at this talk. So, um, so I, uh, uh, the title of my book is Direct Democracy Rules, the Effects of Propositions, Initiatives, Referendums on State Immigration Legislation in the 21st Century. Uh, so most of what I'm doing is working, um, is looking at the new millennium and how immigration policy at the state level is being created and disseminated uh, in, this, uh, in this millennium. So uh, the way that I'm going to organize my talk is first I'm going to give you kind of like a context and a project framework for what, what I'd like to talk about with my book. Um, I'm going to give a very brief, the briefest of book overviews uh, to talk about each chapter. Uh, I'm going to focus on two chapters in the book uh, to kind of expand for this presentation here. One, uh, talking about the background and the theory uh, that lead to kind of my discussion about direct democracy mechanisms and their effect on state immigration legislation. Um, I would like to go over and share my main, uh, my like meaty empirical chapter about driver's licenses and the effect uh, that direct democracy mechanisms had on driver's licenses. Um, 
in California and Oregon. And then uh, just kind of give some conclusions, uh, some kind of like waxing about what I think um, what I think is important to kind of take away from, from not only these case studies, but also the effect of direct democracy mechanisms on the creation of not only state immigration legislation, but um, how these discussions and how direct democracy mechanisms inform federal immigration legislation. So what we've been seeing in the past you know, 20 years at the very least is an increase in uh, state participation in the creation of immigration legislation. So we know um, that states are in charge of creating uh, legislation for, for any kind of um, area that's outside of the scope of, uh, 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 of the plenary power of the United States, right? So uh, according to the 10th Amendment. However, you know, that, um, that, that distinction gives states a lot of power to actually involve themselves and make legislation about the, with respect to the things that affect our lives the most. With, um, for example, with respect to the way that we set up our education system, a state level education systems, um, how we organize and, and offer access to healthcare, uh, and then finally, how we create and allow uh, the conditions under which we allow people to get licenses, right? So how you become a lawyer, how you become a beautician, if you need a license to be a beautician, or if you need a license to drive. So what we've seen in the past, uh, I can show you the past 20 years, but here's a here's a graph of the past uh, 10 years, uh, we've seen a, a marked increase in the number of legislation that has to do with state immigration being introduced uh, at the state level. And then also we, we see a large number of those, um, those pieces of legislation that are introduced are also adopted. Okay, so states are having, states are making a lot of moves when it comes to immigration policy. Uh, and to add to that, uh, another context where federal legislation is not happening, right? So we're seeing a lot of executive orders that kind of turn, you know, back and forth depending on who's in office. Um, but federal legislation on immigration has been few and far between in the 20th century, or the 21st century, sorry. So, um, so where the movement here is, right, it, where the movement is, is at the state level. So uh, my question, my large question, my puzzle here is like, what explains the increasing role of states in immigration legislation? And what are the factors at the state level that influence state immigration legislation? Uh, I break this up in my book into three different research questions. The first is uh, how do direct democracy mechanisms affect legislator behavior, right? Um, when legislators are discussing of the creation of immigration legislation at the state level, okay? Um, my second question is, you know, what's the causal mechanism that links these direct democracy mechanisms to the passage or lack thereof of state immigration policy? So like, what's the relationship between having direct democracy mechanisms on one hand, and then also making immigration policy on the other? And then finally, uh, what are the ramifications of immigration policy created via these direct democracy mechanisms. So like, what is the, like, what is the big outcome, right? What are the big um, consequences or opportunities that are created because states are making immigration policy? So uh, my first chapter is a discussion, a very brief discussion of California Proposition 187. Uh, and how states became started becoming central actors in immigration legislation at the end of the 20th century. Uh, my second chapter uh, explains my theory, right? That that it's a it's it's a, it's a that introduces this idea of direct democracy mechanisms being like institutional structures that uh, that allow people to create immigration policy. Uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a very different kind of way and with very different results. Uh, three, uh, I start, I, I do two sets of case studies. So two sets of comparative case studies. The first two are in place, or two places where direct democracy, like citizen initiated direct democracy mechanisms, like where people can introduce um, uh, propositions where those don't exist. So these are like my baseline cases, right? Um, and I study, um, 
oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, sorry. This is my, the, this is how legis legislators react to direct democracy mechanisms. Um, this is my big N, sorry. <laughs> uh, this is my big N um, chapter where I find that legislators are more likely to pass immigration policy in states with direct democracy mechanisms. Uh, number four is my case, is my baseline case, uh, two states that don't have immigration or don't have direct democracy mechanisms, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And the fight for in-state tuition and how um, uh, issue entrepreneurs in each of those states worked uh, within the system to enact and eventually uh, the outcome of uh, in-state tuition for undocumented students. Chapter five is um, my case study of two states that have direct democracy mechanisms and how restrictivists, people that um, are uh, against, people that were against giving driver's licenses to undocumented folks, how they did or did not use direct democracy mechanisms to, um, to achieve their policy preferences. And then finally, uh, I kind of talk about uh, the virtues and vices of direct democracy mechanisms. Uh, on the one hand, they were used by uh, the progressives. They were introduced by the progressives at the turn of the 20th century to be able to askew like the over the overpowering political influence of railroads in the West. Uh, and now uh, they become uh, not that right. So the thing the 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 help the 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 the, their use has changed, uh, and, and I argue it's not uh, not for a necessarily more democratic reason. Uh, so I said I'm going to focus on these two chapters here: the federal uh, power states' rights, uh, to kind of give an overview of my background uh, for this project, and then also my theory. And then I'm going to talk about Road Warriors, uh, that particular chapter that compares California and Oregon. So. Uh, what I want to talk about here is, uh, is Proposition 187 is kind of like a critical case, right? Proposition 187, um, it, it, when you study Latino politics or immigration politics or American politics, Prop 187 is one of the, uh, one of the most critical case studies that you can, uh, um, that you can, that you can study. Right. Uh, I want to also talk about the legacy of the direct democracy uh, mechanisms in the United States, how they've been used in the past to marginalize and oppress not only people of color, but also um, uh, but also LGBTQ community uh, and also and as well as immigrants. Right. And then I'd like to introduce my institutional theory of state immigration policy. Uh, my institutional theory not only discusses the behavior of actors, of issue entrepreneurs, but focuses on the idea that the rules of the game, whether direct democracies are present or not, really does affect how successful these groups are. So before we even talk about um, political skill or political resources, we have to talk about the rules of the game. Right, and how they're set up to either facilitate or obstruct or make, uh, make uh, immigration policy more difficult for uh, issue entrepreneurs at the state level. So uh, 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 just a quick background on Proposition 187. It was introduced in 1994 uh, by a uh, bankrupt accountant. Uh, he was a bankrupt accountant, um, a lady that had been fired from the Anaheim PD for using Anaheim PD resources to go after un, uh, undocumented immigrants, suspected undocumented immigrants. Um, somebody, had, somebody that had been on the Your Belinda City Council for about two years and some other kind of like uh, mediocre political people, right, um, were able to get together and write Proposition 187, the Save, Save Our State initiative. Uh, and, and, and you can read all the specifics about that um, proposition, but uh, generally what it did was it prohibited undocumented immigrants from accessing social services at the state level. Uh, some examples, um, it prohibited children that were undocumented from entering public school, from accessing uh, welfare, uh, or social security assistance, or and and um, and it's and at its most draconian, like to deny them hospital uh, access to the hospital. Um, it passed in 1994 with 59% uh, of the vote. So 59% of Californians were like, "Let's do it." 
let's do it. Let's uh, let's let's prohibit undocumented immigrants from accessing these social services. Um, and and in one of the most liberal states in the union, right? This this becomes uh, a really a really big deal, right? Uh, conservatives at the federal level and at the state level were not in support of Prop 187 until they saw that it had passed. And then after that, it became, you know, a rallying cry for Lamar Smith, um, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, and a lot of Tom Tancredo, a lot of people started building their careers on like this, uh, on this type of legislation, right? Legislation that um, denied or, or marginalized undocumented people. So uh, as you may or may not know, Proposition 187, as soon as it was um, passed, uh, there was a lawsuit and it was, and it was uh, held up in the courts and never actually enacted, right? And so I put success in quotes because for, for the, um, for this uh, Californians for uh, immigration reform, right? It was a success in that it, one, it had passed right? Uh, two, it had garnered them attention. Um, but three, it had not been able to actually, it was never actually enacted, right? Um, while it was finding its way through the courts, though, uh, this group, CCIR, was able to use that success at the state level to try and also implement copycat laws in different states that also had uh, citizen-initiated um, uh, propositions, right? So they went specifically to Arizona and they went to Florida, right? Um, before Prop 187 or during the Prop 187, kind of before the election, at the federal level, a lot of conservatives, Jack Kemp, like I said, Lamar Smith, uh, and a lot of upper uh, echelon conservative people were like, this is not going to fly. Right. They were not supportive. They were neither supportive of it. They didn't think that it would win in a liberal state like California. Uh, actually, and, and the fact that they were wrong only, you know, turned them even turn them around even more. Right. And after the, the success of 187, we see the introduction of pieces of legislation like the Immigration and Natural Interest Act, National Interest Act of 1995 uh, that did not pass. The other thing that we see is, and this is perhaps, um, this is perhaps uh, more, it's more interesting to me, right? Is that uh, two years after the failure of Prop 187 uh, to be enacted, Democratic President Bill Clinton includes regulations and ideas from Prop 187, right? Into two of the most significant and also um, restrictive uh, towards immigrants, pieces of federal immigration legislation, right? So he includes uh, this idea that prohibits uh, the, the prohibition of undocumented people from accessing education, uh, health care benefits, welfare benefits, right? He includes them in federal legislation within the IIRA IRA in 1996 and also the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. So the you know the unemployed accountant this uh super xenophobic lady from the post from the uh police office or from the police department uh these people that have no training in uh creating legislation right have somehow in three had somehow in, in in two or three years been able to get their ideas implemented in federal immigration uh legislation So the legacy of Prop 187, one, is that state immigration policy is shaped, one, by unqualified, and maybe shaped by unqualified people, right? These people were not, they're not legislators, they're not people that have to um, uh, uh, compromise, right? Uh, also, they don't know how to write, uh, they don't know how to write bills, Right, most of the um, most of the reason that Prop 187 was put uh, was in court was because parts of it were blatantly unconstitutional. Right, and anybody with like a basic understanding of legislation writing would know that those are things that you cannot do. Um, but you know, the people the, the 187 writers didn't weren't those people, right? So state immigration policy is being shaped by unqualified, maybe being shaped by unqualified people with a few, uh, with some key uh, money, right? So with some key uh, benefactors. 
that those state level outcomes then come to inform and then and justify federal immigration discussions right and they inform and justify those decisions then finally this leads to the question right is immigration policy then being created by the public or is it created by the loudest and the richest right so that, that's a, a central problem with um that's that's centrally in conflict with one of our major tenets of american democracy majority rule so previous iter previous work right has um identified that uh state states create immigration uh, policies as results of demographic change, right? There's more people that are from a different country or more people that look foreign. And so we're gonna start making immigration, uh, state immigration laws to uh, reduce combat, uh, uh, make our state unfriendly, right? The second, uh, another set of work looks at economic conditions, that economic downturns and depressions lead to the creation of these uh, types of uh, immigration policies. And then a third newer set argues that it's not necessarily either of these things, but the partisan makeup of the legislatures at the state level that lead to uh, the creation of uh, restrictive or permissive state immigration policy. So it's not so much like who's there like or um, whether they're contributing, but um, what are the what are the partisan principles of the legislators involved? Uh, we know that direct democracy mechanisms have been used in throughout history uh, with respect to some of the most controversial uh, political issues of our day. So abortion, the death penalty, gay rights, uh, minority rights, and then immigrant rights. The thing, uh, the thing about uh, that's really great about direct democracies is that uh, uh, researchers have found that they actually increase political efficacy and knowledge relative to places that don't have direct democracy mechanisms. And then finally, uh, direct democracy mechanism has, has been shown in the past to actually change legislators' behavior, right? So the, the calculation of <clears throat> supporting or opposing a particular piece of legislation is actually different for legislators in states with direct democracy mechanisms. It's actually different for legislators in states that have propositions, uh, initiatives, and referendums. So, uh, so if, Right. If federalism then does increase the number and power of interest groups, right? Uh, consider your like uh, average state group may not have enough power to change federal immigration law, but they do have enough uh, clout to change Oregon immigration laws, right? Um, that's gonna federalism inherently increases the number of people involved in politics, and the and it changes the the amount of power each of those people have, right? Um, and we know that in direct democracy mechanisms, because issue entrepreneurs can just askew the legislative process entirely, they have more power in the political arena than, like, say, someone who um, lives in a state that doesn't have direct democracy mechanisms. So this is my, my argument for my book is, you know, in states that have direct democracy mechanisms, Groups are incentivized to, to bypass the legislature. They're in, they have an incentive to say, you know what, we're not gonna, we're not gonna compromise, we're not going to interact, um, we're not gonna go through the arduous, you know, multi-year process of uh, getting our immigration policy introduced via the legislature when we can just get enough signatures on a ballot and and present our um, and present our legislation, our bill directly to the people. Okay. So according to this argument, one of my observable implication for this would be, you know, if you have a state that has direct democracy mechanisms, right, then we should see states, uh, state uh, interest groups and issue entrepreneurs using them. They should be exploiting them to achieve their policy goals. So uh, let me give you a little primer on <laughs> uh, direct democracy mechanisms isn't something that they teach in uh, American politics 101. So uh, let me give you just a little kind of uh, 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 a very basic um, uh, explanation of how direct democracy mechanisms may work, right? So uh, this is a traditional, uh, a graphic of a traditional law uh, making process, right? So there's people here on uh, my, right on my left um they elect 
representatives that make up that little legislator house. The legislature makes laws and they pass it to the governor, um, the governor in that fancy hat, right? Uh, the governor signs it, signs a piece of legislation that's been passed in the legislature, right? And then it becomes a law. That's, you know, that's kind of like how, you know, I'm just a bill, like that's kind of how that works. In states that have initiatives and propositions, what you can do is you can actually bypass this traditional lawmaking process, right? And have citizens themselves create um, a bill, get enough signatures to get that bill on the ballot. And through that ballot process and that initiative process, they can actually make their, um, they can make, they can turn their bill, their proposition into an enacted law. Okay, so this is kind of like how it works when you have a, a proposition or initiative. You can actually bypass the legislature and all of that drama that comes with the legislature and the governor, and you just submit it yourself, no need to compromise, you just move on. A referendum is another type of direct democracy mechanism, one where the legislature creates a, a bill, right? It, it is signed by the governor, and after a certain amount of time, it becomes law, right? So, so there's a there's a moment in time between when a, a, a piece of law is signed by the governor and it has yet to become a, 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 a law enacted. A referendum then allows for citizens to question, in essence, it's a question of whether this law should be enacted or not. So after the governor signs it, right, people can introduce a referendum. They get enough signatures on a ballot. They're like, hey, should we, uh, should the, do the people agree with this law that has been signed by the governor? Okay. They put that, they get the required number of signatures. They can put that on a ballot right? And they can nullify that bill or that signed piece of uh, that signed bill from ever becoming enacted into law. Okay. Now, uh, for most states, the two things that, that are required for a referendum to be successful is one, you have to have, you need 150% plus one to affirm that referendum, right? To say, okay, well, we don't, we, uh, we think that this piece of legislation should or should not be allowed to be enacted. And then the other part is that it can't include an emergency clause, okay? So what's an emergency clause? An emergency clause, right, uh, is a, uh, it's, it's written into the bill that enacts a piece of legislation as soon as it's signed by the governor. So I'll say that one more time. So an, an emergency clause is a, a piece of, it's a, it's a wording in the bill right, in the text of a bill that creates, uh, that, that enacts a law as soon as it's signed by the governor. So instead of having this kind of line here, there is no, there is no waiting. As soon as it's signed by the governor, it's turned into, it's enacted into law, okay? So when you have an emergency clause, a referendum then becomes impossible, okay? So, when you have a referendum, you can make, you can, you can include, you can, you can actually invalidate pieces of legislation, right? Unless there's some kind of emergency clause that enacts that bill as soon as it's signed by the governor, right? And this will become important when I talk about Oregon, my Oregon case. So what I'm arguing kind of uh, broadly, right, is that uh, these open or closed political opportunity structures, uh, as in like the, uh, the existence, the presence or absence of direct democracy mechanism. Also, when combined with the skills that uh, issue entrepreneurs have at the state level, those two things affect how successful these issue entrepreneurs are in blocking immigration legislation. Okay. So when we talk about political opportunity structures, uh, political opportunity structures are used in the social movement literature. And so um, I'd like to kind of give a, a rough definition of how I use them here. Um, so we can think about political opportunity structures in the legislature as how open uh, the legislature is to allowing uh, citizen input or citizen action, okay? So uh, consider a very closed political opportunity structure then to be 
uh, uh, the assembly, uh, an assembly that is neither, uh, that is appointed by like a larger, a higher authority, right? So uh, in the Republic of Oman, uh, legislators to the gubernatorial cabinet or legislature are appointed by the king. Right, so so that's an example of like a closed opportunity structure, right? There's not really much input that citizens can give there. They're not even uh, able to elect their own representatives. Um, a, a, a more open political opportunity structure relative to like this appointed legislatures might be a place where um, citizens are able to elect their representatives, right? And then still a more open opportunity structure might be a place where not only citizens are allowed to, where citizens are not only allowed to elect their representatives, but also allowed to bypass those elected representatives and introduce their own legislation, okay? So when we think of political opportunity structures, um, I'd like to think about them relatively as open or closed, right? So relative to a place with direct democracy mechanisms as well as an elected legislature, uh, just places that just have elected legislatures are relatively closed, okay? The next part of my argument uh, has to do with the people themselves, like the, the actors that are working within this larger, in, these larger structures and institutions trying to uh, enact their policies, okay? So if we know uh, the literature tells us, uh, all the behavior literature tells us that issue entrepreneurs really do uh, work to make political change and they can make political change. Um, regularly, they are seen as guides. Uh, regular voters look to issue entrepreneurs and state actors as guides about how they should vote, um, a, 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 an important heuristic for state level politics when not a lot of people know what's going on at the state level. Uh, politically skilled issue entrepreneurs are roughly defined by me as people that have uh, knowledge of the system. They have the resources and the organization to take advantage of the system that they're working in. And when we talk about skills, you know, because there's always different sides, there's always different types of groups. What I'd like to, uh, the way that I compare these groups is I compare their skill relative to other issue entrepreneurs in that same state. Right, so when we talk about California issue entrepreneurs or California restrictionists, we have to compare them to California progressive issue entrepreneurs, right? Um, and the same with Oregon. So uh, I come up with a really neat little two by two table, right? Uh, that taught that 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 explains uh, hypothetically, right? Theoretically, the likelihood of affecting some kind of state immigration legislation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you live in a place that does not have direct democracy mechanisms and you don't have the resources or knowledge or organization to kind of put together a, uh, to mount a, a defense or an attack, um, it's highly unlikely that you're gonna be able to influence policy, right? Uh, if you live in a place that has closed opportunity structures, but maybe you're very, very organized, or if you, if you're, if you have very low um, skill, but you live in an open direct democracy mechanism uh, system, it, it's going to be pretty hard for you to be able to uh, affect change. And then finally, you know, the high likely, uh, if you live in a place that has uh, uh, an open political opportunity structure, the presence of direct democracy mechanism, and you have a lot of skill, it's, it's very likely that you might be able to influence policy change. Right, so this is kind of just a theoretical uh, breakdown of like uh, the different categories of people um, and how likely they are to succeed based on their institutional situation. So uh, uh, let's talk, let me talk about my case studies. Um, I compare Oregon and California. Uh, they are two uh, states that have a similar kind of history as far as uh, agriculture, uh, progressive histories, uh, colonialization, uh, statehood, etc. Um, I also include Oregon because at that same time, uh, they were considering other pieces of legislation that affected undocumented immigrants. So that allows me to, uh, to kind of include for state fixed effects, right? And so what I'll do is I compare between California and Oregon uh, on how restrictivist issue entrepreneurs, people that want to restrict immigration, 
right? How they were able to use or were unable to use direct democracy mechanisms to achieve their policy goals. So I did interviews uh, in 2015. Uh, I got a grant from the uh, uh, from the Labor Relations Board at UCLA. Uh, they they gave me three thousand dollars, so I was able to go do um, uh, data collection not only in Oregon but also in uh, different parts of California. I, I triangulated these field interviews with uh, newspaper interviews uh, and data collection uh, with, um, sorry, legislative uh, analysis and data. Uh, I, 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 int I interviewed a bunch of different people that were close to the driver's license issue in Oregon and California. I was actually able to get an interview with uh, Oregonians for immigration reform, uh, actually a few of them, uh, whose name may sound like California Coalition for Immigration Reform. So they are the restrictivist group that's working in Oregon. Um, I was also able to speak with one of the main uh, assembly members in California, uh, Tom, Tim Connolly, uh, who was also one of the most restrictive, uh, who was also supporting restrictive immigration policy in California. So here's my case study in Oregon, right? In 2013, uh, Governor Katzenberger is that dude in the sunglasses right there in the middle on the left-hand side, uh, signs a bill to offer undocumented immigrants driver's license, the opportunity to get a driver's license, right? That same day, OFER, Oregonians for Immigration Reform, led by the lady in the pink shirt there, um, uh, disseminated a flyer. A, pub, a press state, a press release that they were going to um, that they were going to uh, put this driver's license bill up to a referendum, right? That same day. So you might say, hey, you know, uh, that kind of makes sense. You know, there's not a lot of Latinos in Oregon, so uh, why would they make more inclusive immigration laws? There's not a lot of immigrants in Oregon. Um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it would make sense. If it happened in California, it wouldn't make sense. Like it would make sense that restrictivists would um, be successful in Oregon because there are not a lot of immigrants in Oregon, right? Uh, but that would be wrong. <laughs> that would be wrong, right? Because we can see that during that same year, three other um, inclusive immigrate pro inclusive progressive immigration laws were passed in Oregon at the state level. So they pass this uh, requirement for doctors to have cultural competency when they're interacting with immigrant patients. They uh, signed a bill uh, that required tuition equity for undocumented students. And then finally, another, uh, another bill that offered pre and postnatal care to undocumented women, right? Now, these are expensive, time-consuming, lengthy pieces of legislation that are progressive. Okay, so it doesn't make sense that driver's licenses wouldn't be successful in Oregon. Okay, well, we'll talk about, we'll talk about, I'll, I'll talk about why I think that, that this is the case. So one main thing that separates the driver's license bill from all the rest of these other bills is that SB 833, the driver's license law, did not have an emergency clause. Right. And all those other three uh, pieces of legislation, cultural competency, tuition equity, and pre and postnatal care, they all had emergency clauses. Right. The DMV at the time had requested that the legislature not include uh, emergency clause language so that they could better prepare for the, for the influx of undocumented people seeking licenses. Okay. This was the moment, the opening in the political opportunity structure that allowed uh, restrictive issue entrepreneurs to uh, to actually make change. Okay, so if we look at this within case comparison, right, tuition equity, no, uh, it had an emergency clause. Cultural competency included an emergency clause. So did pre and postnatal care. Okay, Ofer did not have the skill, right, to overcome pieces of legislation that already had an emergency clause. Okay. And so for these three pieces of legislation, that same legislative session, referendums were not possible. However, for driver's licenses without the emergency clause, okay, uh, they were able to, one, very quickly put together enough money, 
put together enough political support, gather enough signatures, and 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 put that piece of that bill on uh, on a ballot. Okay. Now, it's not just the rules of the game. That's for sure, right? Because issue entrepreneurs themselves make a difference, and, and the difference that they make is how much uh, how much how much skill they have. How much skill and how much money, right? So when I introduced interviewed Cynthia Kendall, the lady in the pink shirt um, from Ofer, she was the president at the time. She did not know what a referendum was until she was in conversation with other restrictivist groups, and they explained to her that because of the lack of an emergency clause, that Ofer could introduce a referendum, right? So that's an example of how uh, issue entrepreneurs. Uh, skill, right, is important in creating and affecting change, right? So it's not just like, uh, it's not just the rules of the game. It's also how people play that game, okay? Uh, this is a quote from her. She's like, if you hadn't told me, he being the uh, uh, Washington restrictivist group, uh, we wouldn't be here, right? They were able to get money from a few private donors to, um, put together large petition drives to gain enough uh, signatures to put uh, SB 833 on the ballot. And, and during the time, from the time they had expressed that press, they had disseminated that press release, they were learning strategies from California restrictionists who were fighting that same fight in California, but were unable to have any success, okay? So their skill, increased, right? From not being able to do anything or in introduce any kind of change from not even knowing what a referendum was, right? To in a few short months, getting the skills, the knowledge and the resources from a few private benefactors, right? To be able to, uh, to, 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 um, to invalidate SB 833. Okay, uh, I'll just move on from this, right? Uh, so uh, restrictionists in Oregon were able to invalidate driver's licenses for undocumented people, right? Uh, even though they had, uh, at, the, at the time they were starting, they didn't have enough skills. Uh, they didn't have any resources to speak up, uh, but they were working within an institution that allowed them to start the process and gaining all of those skills, they were able to make real policy change. So compared to California, right, a state that had passed Proposition 187 uh, like 20 years ago, right, uh, the 21st century had seen the introduction of quite a few progressive immigration policies, right, the DREAM Act, the Trust Act, and then in 2013, uh, California introduced the uh, driver's licenses, AB60, driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. Uh, restrictivist immigration uh, issue entrepreneurs were nowhere to be found here. There were no, uh, there, the most I could find was um, a couple of uh, restrictivist issue entrepreneurs had testified at a state legislature hearing, right? But there was no movement towards uh, petitioning. There was no putting together money. There was no, um, uh, there was no increase in resources or skills to address uh, this, this, this driver's license issue, right? When I asked uh, Tim Connolly, the uh, assemblyman who was who had headed uh, petitions and, and initiatives against the Dream Act and the Trust Act, I asked him, you know, what happened with driver's licenses? Why weren't there? Why wasn't there more like movement by restrictive activists against driver's licenses? His answer to me was that they had exhausted all of their resources fighting against the Dream Act and the Trust Act, and that there wasn't anything left to fight against this new driver's license bill, right? So that to me shows that issue entrepreneurs in California, restrictivist, uh, restrictivist issue entrepreneurs in California did not have the political skill, the resources of the organization necessary to mount the adequate defense in California against driver's licenses in 2013. So, uh, if we do this cross-case comparison, right, or Oregonians, right, Oregonians for immigration reform working in Oregon 
had relatively high political skill there, right? And were able to overturn uh, driver's licenses in Oregon. California restrictivists had relatively low political skill in California. And so they were unable to stop the passage of driver's licenses in, immigration, in, uh, in California. Okay, so let's turn back to my paper or to my little uh, two by two table here uh, and start populating it with cases, right? The cases that I just spoke about. One, California restrictionists were, had low political skill in an open political opportunity structure. And so their, their success was unlikely. Right, Oregon restrictivists, after their dis their um, discussion about what referendums were and their increase in skill, resources, and organization, working with high political skill, were able to take advantage of this political opportunity structure, this open political opportunity structure, and introduce their own uh, a block, right, a piece of legislation that had been introduced by the legislature, right. So. Uh, I want to talk about the importance of direct democracy rules here, right? The emergency clause here is critical, right? Understanding the counterfactual that if Cynthia Kendall, the, the leader of OFER, had never heard of, had never had that conversation with the Washington restrictivist groups, she, they, this never would have happened, right? Uh, but rules only structure, they really structure the opportunities, right? And you need actors that can recognize openings and take advantage of them. Uh, so revisiting my observable implications, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, state interest groups take advantage of direct democracy mechanisms and exploit them for their policy goals, right, uh, to, the, to, uh, to the detriment of a lot of other people. A lot of people ask, uh, you know, what about permissive immigration laws versus direct indirect democracy mechanisms? Uh, and I argue, you know, that that's actually something that can happen. Um, uh, direct democracy mechanisms could be used as an avenue for progressive immigration uh, issue entrepreneurs. Um, however, what I argue in the book is that, you know, uh, we live in a, these, these direct democracy mechanisms, people are actually really uh, reticent to change. And so any kind of framing would have to be kind of from a conservative context. Like it would have to be like some kind of framing uh, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be too, um, too idealistic or, or radical like it would have to be like some kind of um something that everybody can support like things about the economy or things about like maybe the environment in more liberal places right um but i do find evidence that maybe progressive activists can use uh direct democracy mechanisms uh in particular states right so um what I, I, I use the 2020 ANES, and I just did a really quick kind of um, uh, cross tab of like how many people answered, uh, agreed with the statement that immigrants are good for America. Okay. And of the 21 states that have citizen initiated state statutes, like the 21 states that allow for citizens to introduce uh, legislation, 18 of them have, uh, uh, have respondent rates. Uh, uh, in agreement with the with the statement that immigrants are good for America in the 50% plus range, right? So 18 out of 21 states that allow for propositions uh, in those states, more than 50% of people are, are thinking that immigrants are actually good for the economy, right? So this might be a, a plausible frame that immigrant, progressive immigrant activists can use uh, to be able to talk about direct democracy mechanism, uh, to use direct democracy mechanisms to their advantage. Right, so restrictive immigration entrepreneurs are using direct democracy mechanisms, not only to enact their own policy preferences, but also to block other kinds of legislation. Right, um, and we see this in other areas, not just immigration politics. So Prop 8, it was uh, the Catholic Church, the Church of Latter-day Saints, and a bunch of money from this lady from one, one or two people, like millions of dollars, right? Uh, and then also English only, only initiatives, Right, are in, were introduced by one guy in three different states that allow for uh, uh, citizen initiated state statutes. Right, many of these groups are actually small but well funded, so it makes it sound like they're coming from everywhere, but it's actually really small groups of people. 
So what does this say about the future of immigration laws, right? Well, one, I think it kind of talks about the purpose, the, the kind of perverted purpose that direct democracy mechanisms have, have uh, met these days. You know, it's not really, it used to be some way for the people to get their voice across. And now it just kind of seems like something that special interests are using to make blanket policy. Uh, and then what does it tell us about democracy? Well, like, are we living in a polyarchy, you know, like Dahl tells us, or are we living in a tyranny of the minority, right? That undermines one of the basic tenets of our, uh, of our American democracy, right? The basic tenet of majority rule, right? Where there's small groups of people that have like radical ideas or extreme ideas and that are well-funded uh, are able to institute a serious change, not only at the state level, but at the federal level. Okay, I'm done. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thank you, Andrea, for uh, sharing with us a little bit of your book, just so that everyone knows if there's a six month old that starts making some noise, he's super enthused about the book and that's what's coming from my microphone. Awesome. Um, I mentioned in the chat that the rules of engagement would be that we would listen to the um, to the presentation here. And now we have space to uh, invite the audience to engage with the author of the book. And so you can uh, populate in the question and answer um, window any specific questions that you might have. I see that there was already one there. And then I'll facilitate um, and sort of run interference here uh, for our guest. So the very first question that is asked um, is asking, wasn't that the same thing that happened in Arizona with SB 1070? And I'm wondering if our audience member, Erica Andiola, might clarify um, a little bit about what uh, she means when she says uh, the same thing. What are we referring to here? And I've invited you to speak in your own words, uh, Erica, if you would like. And you, so you should, you should have privileges now to turn on your mic. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, no, I kind of take my question back, but it was mostly around, there was a comment really kind of earlier in the, well, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was really great, <laughs> just jumping in. Uh, yeah, no, there was there was a part of the presentation uh, that was talking about, you know, just how really well funded people with a lot of knowledge can make such a big difference. And I know uh, SB 1070 in Arizona uh, was, you know, very much, I think my understanding of it is that it was very much influenced by what happened to California, but it wasn't a uh, it, it wasn't passed by the voters. It was actually legislature. Uh, but my understanding of it is that it, it was basically written at the very beginning by people who had a special interest, uh, but was handed over to the to the state legislature for for them to to pass it. Um, so you know, it, it wasn't necessarily like citizens voting for it. But at the end of the day, I think it did come from uh, very skilled actors who had you know, certain interests. So that, that's what I meant by my, by my question, but I think the rest of your presentation kind of uh, made it a lot more clear for me. So thank you. I, I think you're absolutely right. Like, uh, I, I, and on a, on a larger scope, there are these other kind of issue entrepreneurs like Alec, uh, I, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but uh, they're a group that creates and copies legislation, conservative legislation, and they just disseminate it to, uh, any state legislature or legislators who are amenable, you know, and 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 in that way they are creating legislation uh, that makes it sound like it's coming from the people, but it's actually coming from a very small group of conservatives. So yes. Thanks. And there's a couple of questions that have also populated the chat area. I'm going to invite uh, folks to move their questions over to Q and A, but let me catch uh, at least two of them that um, appear in the chat. One uh, asks you to go back to your question, is immigration legislation led by the public or the loudest and the richest? And there uh, is an invitation after some observations about how, yeah, California is one of those states that has a bunch of propositions on the ballot and it can be very confusing. And so voters themselves need to rely on cues. And so the, the question comes down to, can you say more about how 
the tyranny of the minority might be avoided at the state level? Oh, that's a great question. Okay. Well, if I had the answer to that, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> I, would, I would sell it and patent it. Um, you know, I, I, you know, you know, when you start doing political science, you're like, yeah, I want to be a voice for the people. And then you realize, like, you know, sometimes the people don't have the best ideas. Uh, you know, sometimes they sometimes they need some help, you know, um, and, 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 you know, one idea would be to get rid of citizen initiated ballots. Uh, but I think that 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 is also problematic, right? Because there will be one day when when that needs to happen. Um, perhaps putting more safeguards on the types of initiatives that need to be introduced. Um, you know, sometimes I think sometimes I think the framers are these snooty old guys that didn't want people to have their own minds or didn't trust the public, uh, and then. And then when I interview, you know, people from OFER and, and read about uh, CCIR, I'm like, oh, maybe they didn't have the worst idea there. Um, and, you know, I'm not I'm not sure. That's for people that are a lot smarter than I am. But I think uh, one one of the starts is educating uh, voters and making and, and making the barriers to education and participation a lot lower than they are today. Thank you. Uh, um, a distinct but in some ways related question asks you to take on um, uh, or give us some thoughts on what factors make it more or less likely for legislators uh, and or governors to ignore um, uh, direct democracy and, and initiatives. So there's a couple of examples of uh, in this state in Arizona voters approved more K through 12 education spending, but the governor didn't add those additional funds in the state budget. Uh, LePage in Maine has refused to spend money on senior housing that was approved by voters. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about what factors make that more or less likely uh, to happen? Um, so uh, the literature tells us that there are, let me open my, so I can say it correctly. Um, the literature tells us that that um, that politicians will do things when they're when it's in their best interest for a couple of reasons, right? And so um, uh, one, it, it, they do things to help them get reelected, right? And two, they do things that help make the, that that make them look good or look better, right? Kind of in the um, uh, uh, in the uh, in the public view, and then also they are incentivized uh, to pass immigration to preempt other groups uh, that are trying to get a hold on kind of whatever's happening, right? So like they want to be the first this, to say they want to be the first to say like I was part of this at the beginning, right? Um, so under what conditions do legislators ignore things when they know that it won't be uh, when they know there won't be detrimental to their reelection, when they've calculated that it won't be detrimental to their reelection, when they've calculated that it will be detrimental to their political uh, credibility, right? Um, that's when they ignore stuff. Yeah. And so um, for a very long time, uh, uh, Pete Wilson, right, then governor of California during uh, Prop 187, was very was not very vocal. He was supportive, but he wasn't vocal about um, about Prop 187 at all until it passed, and then he was like on the bandwagon, and all of his you know, um, all of his uh, uh, all of his uh, literature for re-election and election had to do with like immigrants and how scary they are, uh, and so I argue that the literature tells us that you know legislators ignore issues when they think that it's uh, politically, uh, not politically costly, costly to do so. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I'm going to scoot back over to the question and answer answer um, window where uh, the next question invites you to mm -hmm. grapple with a larger pattern in contemporary mm -hmm. immigration policymaking. It seems that immigration policymaking is made across levels of government, so not just national, but also subnational and by various, not just elected, but also non-elected actors. Is this what you are seeing as well? Yes, yes, right. And so uh, the, the, these are just two 
instances. This is just a, two case studies that show a mechanism uh, that show uh, the relationship between direct democracy mechanisms and issue entrepreneurs. But I think you're absolutely right, Angie, if I may call you Angie, uh, that like uh, this is happening at all levels and with all people, right? So immigration policy is coming from everywhere and that's due to federalism, right? So it's not just that um, the federal government is the one creating immigration policy, right? Like, yes, uh, the yes, the federal government has plenary power over the execution and creation of immigration policy, for sure. Uh, and there's a lot of people always lobbying that federal um, that federal policy sphere. But at the state level, like imagine there's like there's 50 states and each state has like X number of um, people that are working on immigration policy things and each of those immigration policy uh, issue entrepreneurs are working at it from a different angle right and there's some conservative groups that include that um, that that speak to immigration policy there's some immigration groups that speak to like uh, you know anything that you can say or anything that you can um, uh, that you can discuss about immigration policy there's probably an interest group that exists about, about it, right? Um, but yes, like, I think that's kind of dangerous. You know, we don't know where these ideas are coming from, right? So the idea that uh, undocumented kids can't go to college was an idea that was that was created by these people, right? These Prop 187 people. And it's, and I think that's really, I think that's really problematic. I think that's really problematic. Uh, another question uh, starts with the observation that one interesting aspect is the use of these propositions uh, to generate fear and attempts to tarnish, tarnish perceptions of particular groups. Yeah. Prop 202 in Arizona was basically mimicking Perora, the Personal Responsibility uh, and Welfare Act at the federal level, so not really needed, but it brought back to the forefront the narrative that immigrants were on the welfare rolls. Yeah. Uh, not really a question perhaps a reaction? <laughs> well, we are, you know, we are as humans, we're hardwired to uh, notice fear, right? Whether it's like a saber tooth tiger running at you, you know, or a car, you know, so we're, whenever we're identified, whenever there is um, uh, some possibility or threat, you know, our little ears pop up. And so that's a wonderful way to get people's attention. Um, when it comes to immigration, right? If you can scare people into thinking that immigrants are taking your money, uh, that's a that's a really uh, useful way to get people to the ballot box. So I'm wondering, you know, what can progressives uh, also like? How can they frame issues that would get people to come to the ballot box? That's the other part of that question. So. Um, uh, now a question about following up on that is a great pivot to what kind of citizens they make. Um, one wants to know, uh, or one question uh, from, let's see, this is, let me get this from the chat. Let me scroll up, was uh, from Janet Kirkpatrick says, yeah, we see that you talked about um, how uh, DDMs do boost skill level. Um, we've got evidence of that in the literature. But um, what about when it comes to an appetite or skill for a compromise or negotiation, which seems like they might not value if they have to go around some of those institutional rules that bake in negotiation and compromise um, into uh, the system. So is that right? Um, expressing some interest here in what these citizens using DDM are like, what they value, are they good uh, small D Democrats or not? That's a great, yeah, that's a great question. I don't, that's, uh, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, I think, um, personally, uh, I, uh, I wonder, you know, when I speak, when you speak to these people in person, you know, they seem like pretty okay people. Like, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I sat down with Cynthia Kendall and I asked her, I, on the phone, I asked her questions, right? Um, you know, she didn't, she didn't, use any racial epithets against me or, you know, um, and, and, and so I wonder, you know, uh, when I speak to these folks, like they think that they are doing a service. They think that they are doing a service for the United States and for democracy. But that is that literally that is what they think. Right. And so when, uh, when you base, if you judge people by their intentions, then yes, they are good Democrats because they're participating in the in the in the democracy, right? But when you, if you were to judge them by the outcomes, 
right, then no, because they are effectively trampling one on your right as a member of the public to have your will done, your popular sovereignty done, right? And then, and then also they're undermining the rights of people that live in the United States. So I think it kind of depends on on what you're what you're judging that on. If you're judging it on their intentions, then yes, they're good. Um, they're on their own intentions, and yes, they're good Democrats. Um, and if you're judging it on the outcomes, well, it depends on whether you value popular sovereignty and majority rule, right? Um, we've got a question from uh, your colleague, Professor Martinez Evers. And I'm going to read it direct, just as you have typed it, Val. It says, I wanted to ask whether it is true that governors and state legislatures do not have to voter initiatives. Does that like honor voter initiatives? Uh, besides voting them out of office, what can voters do if this occurs? And I'll let you answer that, Anzira. And, and in the meantime, I'll see if I can open up your mic, Val, so you can have a chance to clarify a few. Oh, do not have to follow voter initiatives. That was in, in the follow-up question in Q&A. Yeah. So um, it it depends on the state right so some places uh do not require um they do not require the legislature to follow along with what citizen initiatives say in oregon and california it is mandated that that those policies be enacted and supported so it depends like <laughs> the joke is like you know uh this is a joke that antonin scalia uh, he was writing, he was giving an address about federalism in 1981. And he was like, the joke about federalism is like that joke about um, how's your wife? And the, the punchline is compared to what? There's no, like there, there is no standard fundamental regulation, you know, about what federalism is supposed to look like. And so states are, it's at their discretion, right? And I included in my book, um, just a list of all of the different, um, the different, different states, all 50 states and the different types of uh, citizen initiated or legislative initiated direct democracy mechanisms that are available. So, you know, uh, yes, and what can citizens do? Constitutional conventions, I suppose, other than, you know, vote people out. I see. Thank you. Um, let me uh, ask another question here that was in the Q&A window, and then we'll go back over. There was a, a couple more that appeared in the chat uh, from uh, my colleague, Paul Lewis. I wonder how straightforward it is to attribute political skill or lack of skill to issue entrepreneurs after the fact. For the group in Oregon, for example, the argument is that they lack the requisite skill until they didn't anymore. I worry that after the fact, we may judge skill based on whether their effort succeeded or not, just the endogeneity probably, or is there a more systematic way to assess political skill? Uh, yes, that is a, that's like something that I think about, uh, it keeps me up at night, frankly. Uh, like I think about it a lot, right? And I, um, and, and I think the way that I've measured skill is if they've been able to, in their own state, achieve change. Right. If you can achieve change in your own, if you're, if you can achieve change in your own uh, political context, then you have enough skills to achieve change. I, I see how, like, uh, it may not. It's definitely not like a uh, a measurable kind of like. It's a fuzzy kind of. Uh, it's a fuzzy dichotomous kind of thing, right? Um, I'm trying to think about how I would measure that uh, in a way that would be that would be that it would be possible to kind of make uh, a distinction, right? Um, that's definitely something that I think about a lot. Uh, let's see uh, the question from our colleague ASU here, uh, Angel Molina. I have a broad question that's a little less specific than the others. There's a growing concern about the state's role in the state's role in democratic backsliding on a national scale. Yeah, I've been wondering if this backsliding is driven more so by particular policy arenas than other than others. Can you give your thoughts on what role, if any, immigration policies in the states have played in macro democratic backsliding, if any? 
you know, I, I think uh, I think I think all of these kinds of uh, policies, 187 in California, Prop 200 in Arizona, like they all kind of set the precedent that um, that it's okay to deny people some people rights, right? They set a precedent that argues that it's okay that if some people don't have their fourth or fourteenth amendment rights because they're undocumented, that's okay. Right. Or um, it's OK if undocumented people don't uh, have the right to a driver's license because they're undocumented. So it's, it's a precedent that we're that we're willing to trample on people's uh, constitutional rights. Right. Um, for the sake of, uh, you know, political success or whatever, you know, whatever people get out of uh, restricting immigrants from what they're doing. And so. I think that that offers people uh, a slippery slope and a justification for doing it in other areas as well, right? I don't think like I don't I can't tell you right now that there's a direct link between immigration politics, uh, restrictivist immigration politics, and democratic backsliding. I can't tell you that. Um, but what I can tell you is that it makes it easier to do those things when you have legislation that takes away people's constitutional rights. Even like we think that there's some kind of uh, there's something special about undocumented immigrants that they don't deserve or they don't have constitutional rights. And that's absolutely untrue. Right. But the idea that we uh, can take their rights away, at, you know, without very much thought um, sets a precedent for this larger kind of backsliding. Uh, let's see, double check. Okay, so I don't see any other questions in either the chat or the Q&A. So I'll ask, I have a question, but before I ask mine, I'll ask if our, if my co-host Rodney has a question that he'd like to ask. And we've got about two minutes or so left in the time that we've allotted. Francisco, uh, I have a question. It's kind of a follow up to what Angel Molina just posed to you. Uh, you know, again, the the matter of are some some uh, kinds of issues more broadly symbolic and are understood differently. And I, I and related to that is what the question of issue framing. And Paul Lewis asked a question about can you tell us in advance whether you know somebody is a skillful entrepreneur rather than after the fact and don't they I, I believe various scholars have used things like the amount of advertising uh, that you know how much money is spent on advertising that's not that's not a great uh, or a perfect mm -hmm. indicator or anyway. But again, I, I guess I, I do wonder why certain kinds of things happen. One other example I guess I would ask about is something like minimum wage laws. Because mm. you focus on a certain kinds of issues that I think are arguably more cultural in nature rather than economic uh, equality or whatever. So, so are there different, I mean, part of what it seems to me happens is that each of these kinds of initiatives to some degree have their own politics, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you're capturing some things, but I'm not sure it applies to others. And I'm so I'll, I guess part of what I'm asking as well is the breadth of your argument and how it holds up in different arenas. And yeah, so, uh, Francisco, I'm sorry, because I may have chewed up all your time. So so you obviously had the prerogative to to uh, ask a question later. Yes, uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I mean, yes, I, like I, I think the idea of immigration politics is uh, somewhat of a defined field, right? Like, yes, this is. Uh, but the idea that um, there are opportunity structures and skilled um, issue entrepreneurs that take advantage of those opportunity structures. Like I said, you can see that in Prop 8. You can see that in the English only. Like these are small groups of well-funded people. I have, a, I have a problem with the money, looking at just the money, because, um, you know, uh, uh, coming from being poor, you know, it's not, I, I had to be resourceful, not just about, and it wasn't just about having money. So, you know, I really think about like, how can I best uh, measure that? And I think that's something that's kind of, I think my goal here is kind of just to show that there's these groups and they, you know, they work within these systems and it's really important to understand the rules of the game, right? Um, 
and I, and I think it's for maybe uh, future people to think about how to measure that kind of success, like skill, right? Because I, I think money is not good enough for a, not a good enough measure. I may just leave you with this question, but if you have a quick response, yeah. um, um, it has to do with an observation that has always left an impression on me whenever I come across literatures about direct democracy, and that's the role of the courts. So you were talking about the bigger political opportunity structure and some of the cases, including Prop 187, include a backstory where the courts eventually come in and say, like, well, nice try, guys, but we also have these other rules and things we need to square up. <laughs> This doesn't square up, so sorry, try again. Yeah. Um, and so do you have any thoughts or comments or reactions about um, the, I don't know, patterns in judicial politics over the last 10 years, certainly over the last five or so with lots of court appointments at the lower level of individuals who on paper may not have been uh, particularly experienced <laughs> yeah. in, in legal matters, but nonetheless get appointments and what this means, right, for the arbiters of, you know, laws and legal matters, especially as it relates to what the people uh, put forth in uh, through these initiative processes. Okay, so I mean, I think we can all agree that incompetent people are not helpful when it comes to making decisions, right? Incompetent people, like people that are not competent in what they do, uh, you know, I, I strive to to be competent because I, you know, there's a there's a problem technically when you're not, right? Um, but what you're talking about is like one of the things that like I think is super understudied when we talk about immigration politics at the state level, and that is how state legis how judicial the how the judicial system interacts with state legislation, right? So like after all of this stuff happens, right? After all of the things that I'm talking about happens, then comes the 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 judicial like decisions that come after these these ideas in the passage right so like there's a whole other breadth of work right that that you know i wanted as an as an as a as an enterprising graduate student i wanted to include that also in my dissertation but i just couldn't i didn't have the time um like how who are these people that are making decisions not only on state immigration legislation but also federal immigration legislation like who are these people Right, that that have the power to undermine a a, um, a, a state law, right? A, 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 and 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 where do these people come from, and how are they held accountable for what they do? Uh, you know, I, I suppose that they're not, and that's a that's really that's problematic, also, right? But then also it could just be problematic because I don't agree with the outcome, and then what does that say about me? <laughs> right, that's also a problem. No, thank you um, so much. We've we've reached the end of our time, but before we close, I just want to thank the audience for joining us uh, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, thank our presenter for virtually connecting with us all the way from Texas. We certainly hope that you're faring well, uh, given the nasty weather news. Uh, I, I've lived through that before myself last year, and so I know how how difficult it can be. I hope that you stay well. Um, and for the rest of you in the audience, uh, as we can't really give an applause, but I guess on your own, give an applause, say thank, thank you. you. And we look forward to uh, inviting you back uh, to continue. You certainly got us off to a great start uh, to our distinguished speaker series. Thank you, Professor Silva. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming on a Friday afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being on. And we have many other events uh, that we are involved in. So please keep your eyes and ears open for those. Okay. Yes. And, and uh, best wishes to all of you. And thank you for being on. Thank you, everyone.